Can you can you start by introducing yourself briefly again for the few of the people listening that missed the first part? Uh, sure. My name is Nate Hagens. Uh, I run an organization called energyinourfuture.org. I also run a podcast called The Great Simplification. Um, put up videos of the podcast and uh, animations and lectures on Nate Hagen's YouTube channel. 20 years ago, I worked on Wall Street, um, kind of saw the light on how the big picture system was going to have a phase shift during my lifetime, gave my clients their money back, got a PhD in natural resources, and for the last 20 years have been connecting the dots of all the different uh, scientific aspects that comprise what I refer to as the human predicament, energy, ecology, money, biodiversity, climate, anthropology, neuroscience. And so I've spent 20 years kind of compiling uh, a systems overview of what humans face in coming decades and, and this century. Yeah, and and this is why I like so much to to listen to you and to your videos and to read to read also the few articles you write because uh, you, you basically started you know 15 years before me to investigate and try to connect the dots. So that's that's really saving me a lot of time, and I think it's saving a lot of time to a lot of people. Um, yeah, I came across a quote recently that I quite like. <clears throat> I'd never heard it before. Uh, but Albert Einstein said, um, if I had an hour to save the world, I would spend 55 minutes understanding the problem and five minutes solving it. And so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing is I'm trying to look at not one of the component problems like climate change or inequality or debt or biodiversity, but look at the drivers of the entire system, because we have to fly up high enough and look down at how, what, what are the real drivers and it's a system. So I'm, you know, that was the genesis of starting the podcast was to get more people to kind of widen the lens with which they view our challenges and change the discourse so that we're talking about the system which then informs what we might do about it. And it's also about um, fighting the good questions before you know rushing into finding solutions. Which is your thing. That's your superpower. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, tell me a little bit more about it. You know, what you've been busy doing um, since January and specifically that podcast, but you also did a video and we can talk about this a little bit after, but... If I could, you know, I would invite 100% of your guests and, and I really always reference your, your podcast because your creation is great and I'm learning so much from this conversation. So why did you start this podcast now and what is your approach to this investigation of, of your own, basically? Thank you for that question. Um, it's really kind of a, a non-profound answer. Um, why did I start the podcast now? because I didn't start it in the past, uh, is the short answer. Um, I started it for two reasons. One, I realized that I know hundreds of scientists, speakers, and activists that I've developed a network with over the last two decades. You know, Paul Ehrlich and Dennis Meadows and you know, Bill Reese and uh, Herman Daly, uh, Nora Bateson, uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, and I'm like, well, why don't I just try to pull out the pieces of their expertise that are relevant to the story that um, the narrative that I see unfolding in coming decades. And that way um, more people can learn. And it's not just some guy in his basement doing a, you know, a, a, a monologue about what I think I'm, I'm getting the expertise from lots of other humans who largely agree with me. So for me, the first step was it's easy. I know all these people, I'll call them up and let's just have some conversations. To this day, I've, I'm on podcast number 37 this week. I still haven't interviewed someone that I don't know. <laughs> and eventually, and eventually I'll have to do that and they might disagree with me. <laughs> but for now I'm, I'm interviewing my friends and colleagues. The second thing that, uh, well, some of them are energy experts, uh, 
tomorrow I'm interviewing a finance expert, the first one of those. Uh, a lot of them are ecological economists. We talk a lot about species loss, uh, the impact of uh, endocrine disrupting and other plastic chemicals on our world, um, climate, uh, um, refinery, uh, biodiversity, um, philosophy of, of metacrisis, all, all this um, contributes to an understanding of our world. Um, and then the other, the other reason that I started it is it's really been swimming upstream, telling this story uh, in its various forms over the last 20 years. And I decided finally, you know what, I'm going to send out a beacon, a signal to those humans that are curious and anxious and upset, but are pro-social and want to understand where we are, what we face, what are the leverage points, what can we do at various scales at the individual level, all the way up to the global level, and have people that are around the world that are interested in those things find this signal rather than try to come up with a message and put a square box in a round hole for the general public because I failed at that. Well, I'm succeeding at this because there's people in a lot of countries. It's it's either the number one or number two uh, ranked podcast in, in the category of earth sciences, especially in, interestingly, France and uh, for some reason, Australia and New Zealand, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, but probably because in France, collapsology is a, is a thing. Um, and so these conversations are maybe uh, not so foreign or shocking to, you know, your listeners or, or people in France. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's okay. been a surprising thing, Julian, because I kind of have a strong personality and I have a strong opinion about how pieces fit together in the world. And so I thought I'd be having these two way conversations and I would weigh in and disagree. And what about this? And over time, I'm gradually kind of learning the skill that you've acquired and developed, which is I'm just midwifing the conversation and trying to pull the wisdom and expertise out of my guests. And I don't say a lot and I with I bite my tongue a lot and I highlight the the life work of my guests uh, to curate um them as kind of a library of different subjects so it took me to a while to realize that that was kind of a a different skill than my analytical systems view of the world i'm just being kind of a you know loquacious sasquatch who is uh carrying on a conversation uh with other people and it's not that difficult for me to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I have a yeah. team that does the production. I kind of like it. I do a little bit of prep work, you know, an hour or two, and then I just show up and do it. So, so far it's been easy and fun. Well, that's the thing. That's also because you already have a, a great level of knowledge that allows you to, you know, to, to know what are the good questions where a lot of people would need to prepare it much more. I mean, talking about me, you know, it, so, so, but it's, um, it's very valuable. I, I think also I talked about a lot about your podcast to a lot of people in France. So maybe that, maybe they helped hopefully, uh, promoting it. And, uh, and that's to, to, tomorrow, to steer more people. Yeah. Tomorrow, which won't be tomorrow when this is released, but tomorrow, um, I interviewed a French person, Timote Parik. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Of, of he, came, he came in Sismic, yeah. Okay, yeah. Amazing guy. Yeah, one of the few people that can that can speak fluently uh, English in France. Yeah, no, charming, charming young man. Very mm. uh, high energy and articulate. Yeah. So um, I would like to to get back to your starting point because I, I guess that again a lot of people that are listening to this conversation will have missed the um, the first one. And I think it's important also to to get back to your own ideas uh, before trying to uh, see how they've changed, you know, over the past eight months talking to all these people, if they had, if they have. Um, and also because you published uh, a great, great videos uh, to summarize you, what you think is um, what you call the, the great predicament. So and you have a truly systemic great way of simplification. Um, great simplification, sorry, the, which is our predic predicament. And you have a truly systemic systemic way um, 
of looking at you know current global issues and you manage you know as you said to connect complex issues in a way that i find quite unique so energy is very central to how you explain our situation but you also look at you know economics like psychology power games so can can we go through that narrative of yours you know which is under the name of great simplification uh, summarized how you describe you know that that human predicament and untangle the whole thing of course that could take an hour to go through that because the videos are here for that but just to understand your bird's eye view So like I said, I've spent 20 years assembling all the pieces and a few times I thought I was wrong and I started over and um, I every time I arrived at the same place, there's three core components. One is that humans are biological organisms. Um, our brains evolved um, for what worked in the past at the same way our bodies did. So humans alive today, the 8 billion of us, go through our daily routines in a vastly novel world to get the same emotional states of our ancestors. We look for status. We look for approval. We look for convenience. We care about the present more than the future. We're inc incredibly tribal. Uh, we have belief systems that we look at truth only if it uh, helps our identity and our tribe. And so that's uh, are, are, are rife for problems with, with social media and what's happening with polarization, et cetera. So the human behavior is a core uh, pillar of it. The second piece, um, which you alluded to before is that energy is the central currency in nature. Animals were the first investors. They invest some caloric output to get prey and they get a payoff in their prey. And the same thing is applied to human systems in our past and in our present. What we can do depends on how much access to energy we have. And our culture looks at our success and our productivity and our progress based on human ingenuity and technology and money. But we do that during a period when over the last 150 years, every single year, with the exception of some depressions and recessions, we've had an increase in the total amount of scale of energy supporting our economies. And we take it for granted, right? Because fossil energy is around 80 to 85% of our total energy. We are mining this fossil energy 10 million times faster than the earth sequestered it by the daily trickle charge from solar photosynthesis. But because of that refining that Mother Earth did with heat and pressure, it's created this incredibly dense, powerful, magical substance, really, with the exception of the pollution and CO2 it creates. A barrel of oil, which right now today costs 90 euros, can do the work of you or I doing physical labor for four and a half years. So think of how much you would have to pay you or me to do work for four and a half years. And we get that all for under a hundred euros. Why? Because we just pay for the cost of extraction, not the cost of pollution. So fossil energy is abundant. It's powerful, but it's gradually going away. The underlying decline rate of oil is five to 7%. And we're drilling more and more to offset that. But in yours and my lifetime, the amount of oil that human societies have will peak and decline, and that will be permanent. We are accessing this one-time bolus of fossil sunlight, and um, this is the, we are alive during the carbon pulse uh, when our species is basically drawing down this biophysical bank account and treating it as if it were interest, but it's really a bank account. So our entire economy is based on combining energy, materials, and technology, and we grow every quarter and every year. And we create money to represent all this growth. But the money, when we create it, we don't create the interest. So there's this imperative to grow. And what we've been doing is we've been growing our money much faster than we've been growing our economies. Um, so... Um, let me rephrase that. 
We've been growing our monetary claims much faster than our biophysical bank accounts can support. So right now, globally, we are doubling our debt every eight and a half years, and we're doubling our GDP, which is the income stream needed to service and maintain that debt every 25 years or so. And that's before energy starts to decline in its availability. So this is unsustainable. Um, and once we're not able to continue to grow to service these financial claims on reality, we're going to have a economic financial recalibration, which to me is the beginning of what I call the great simplification. The simplification is the inverse word of a complexification. And historian Joseph Tainter, who was one of my recent guests, has done research on the collapse of complex societies that show that humans are problem solvers. And when we encounter a problem, we, uh, we add extra energy to it. And this builds complexity. So as we have more complex supply chains and hierarchies and nodes of transfer and transportation and components into things, we become more dependent on more energy. So my, my broad, theory um, and the work that I'm doing to try and change society to better prepare for this, if we've just experienced a once in a species, two century complexification that is about to go through a one or two century simplification when we have less energy. The third component of, of my story is the environmental impact of our global enterprise is downstream from this metabolic superorganism, which is that humans self-organize <clears throat> as individuals, as families, as small businesses, as corporations, as nation states in order to maximize monetary profits. Our monetary profits are 99% linked to the use of energy, which is 85% linked to carbon energy. So when we talk about let's solve climate change, climate change isn't the problem. It's a symptom of this underlying metabolic drive of a social species finding this huge amount of carbon. And climate change is one of but many environmental stressors. Um, we've lost 70% of the populations of animals, insects, and fish since you and I have been alive. Uh, Julian, there are increasing uh, amounts of endocrine disrupting chemicals showing up in the Arctic and in ants in the Amazon. There was a paper out last week showing that uh, rainwater on the planet, nowhere is it safe uh, to drink because of the chemicals. So climate is just one of many uh, negative externalities of this metabolic system. So that, that, uh, that wasn't a 33 minute video that I made, but that was probably a five minute overview. Um, so that's how things fit together. Human behavior, energy and money and technology and the environment and ecology. And I think we're headed for in the not too distant future, meaning this decade, this financial recalibration, which will mark the onset of a decades and centuries long great simplification which does not have to be a disaster, but we are, we are living beyond our means now. And I think a lot of people recognize that. So we probably have been kicking the can for 50 or 60 years, and now there's a bill coming due and, and we have to prepare for it. And, and, and obviously when you say we, you also acknowledge the fact that there are huge differences. Uh, and you, you always mention it between the rich countries and the poor countries and between the rich within the rich countries and the poor people, et cetera, et cetera. That's also part of the things that you look at because you look at economics and, 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 and all. It's, it's true. And my podcast is mostly directed at people in uh, North America and, and, and Europe and Australia. Um, and I agree with you that things right now are not remotely shared equally. But if you draw the boundaries of inequality, is it, peop is it inequality within the United States? Or is it inequality with humans alive today? 
or is it inequality among generations of humans who won't have this access to energy in the future? Or is it inequality between species? Um, what are dolphins thinking of our metabolic rate? But yeah, absolutely. Um, I personally, on, on the inequality front, I think it's a function of the power laws of energy gain. And I don't know that inequality is going to really disappear until the, the, the scale of our energy um, disappears. But many cultural things can happen. So um, that's the one thing about humans is biologically, there are certain constraints about our behavior, but culturally, we are incredibly plastic. And there's lots of different ways um, that we can respond to the great simplification. What I find very powerful in this story is that it's, um, of course, it doesn't you know, contain the, the entire reality of the system. And, but uh, it helps really understand that everything that's happening today has a logical cause, if you will. It's like there's nothing uh, not normal if you will, in uh, in all the events that are happening, we know we know that they are that that they come from somewhere, and uh, the idea is really to be high enough to see, okay, this is where they come from. This totally makes sense because so it's not because sometimes also we we have people saying that this is an anomaly that this shouldn't be happening, you know. But but actually, when when we listen to your story and connecting all the dots, you realize that this is totally logical you know this is where i'm not saying that this was unavoidable i'm saying that this is what it is anyway and now we need to think about okay if we don't want it to continue if you don't want the trends to be the same we need to go and look at the roots of the trends you know the underlying uh things and uh one of the way one of the if i quote you um <clears throat> one of the phrase i i like from you is uh to try to sum summarize it all is to when you say we are transforming ancient sunlight into dopamine and i really love that phrase because it captures part of the story which is really important which is energy and our behavior as human beings can i think this is an important phrase to you because i i've, I've heard you uh pronouncing it a few times uh, can you can you go into this a little bit is it possible that you've lost your French accent some in the last two years? You almost sound like British now. When you lived in <laughs> Hong Kong, you had like a strong French accent. Um, so, yes, the, the line from the movie was, we're turning billions of barrels of ancient sunlight into microliters of dopamine. And so that what that means is, as a culture, we're drawing down this uh, Earth's battery for short-term, frivolous, uh, fleeting dopaminergic experiences. And effectively, we're wasting um, our, our endowment. Not that it's ours, but we found it. It's part of Earth's prior processes. And it, it's like we are through a two-century party, and now the kind of morning is coming, and we have to, to react. At a deeper level, it offers potential leverage point that we don't need most of these consumption to be happy and live meaningful lives. Um, because after basic needs are met, which granted, like you mentioned earlier, for a lot of humans today, basic needs are not being met. But once basic needs are met, really, the best things in life are free. If you think of your top five best experiences of your life, Julian, they probably, most of them did not include huge amounts of money or energy use. They were things in nature with your wife, with your kids, with your family, with music, with animals, with food. These things don't take a lot of energy. So the average American today, and I can't speak to France, um, but the average American consumes 220,000 kilocalories a day of energy in our bodies we only consume one one hundredth of that so if you take the material footprint of our skyscrapers and our highways and our refrigerators and netflix and disneyland and nascar and hospitals and everything 
it's a hundred times more energy than our bodies actually need to uh, calorically survive. Now you could bump that up by 10 times because we do need hospitals and we need a house and we need lights or, or whatever. So in Spain, um, that's around 50 times the amount. Uh, in most of Europe, it's, it's around 50 times the amount. So we can get by with considerably less energy, but there's no path from here to there. There's a, a movement called the degrow, degrowth movement where they're trying to voluntarily shrink our economies. And I think under certain histories that might have been possible, but I don't think that's possible because of the debt overhang. Governments around the world cannot say, let's just tighten our belt and, and constrain ourselves and consume less. Because the moment that that is voiced, we have a musical chair situation of all the financial claims of what people think they own versus the underlying physical capacity to support them. So that, that I don't, I think we will degrow, but it will be involuntary, not voluntary. Let, let me, let me say one more thing that uh, might help make the scenario a little clearer and, and then you can continue. So I see two scenarios. The default scenario is that somehow we will continue with uh, innovation and that innovation in tandem with uh, more energy, either fossil or renewable, will allow us to continue to grow. But under that scenario, energy and GDP are 99% correlated. Energy and materials are 100% correlated, which means that by the year 2050, if we continue to grow, we will double the amount of energy and materials used in the world relative today. And by 2080, when children born today are 60 years old, we will quadruple the amount of energy and materials used today. So is that possible? Is it desirable? What happens if that does happen? What happens if it doesn't? So that's the default scenario. Um, and you can imagine what will happen to the mm -hmm. natural world if that continues. My, my other scenario, which I think the first scenario eventually devolves into, is at some point we will not be able to continue to grow. And the first thing that we have to face is this financial um, musical chairs event, from which at that moment, the amount of financial claims um, there aren't enough to support them. But at that moment, all of the technology, all of the human social capital, all of the factories and innovation and technology still exist at that moment. So that's kind of what I'm trying to prepare for with uh, discussions with government and the scout team of pro-social humans that kind of get to work in their own communities and in their own lives to maybe prepare for a lower material throughput uh, existence. One of the big, um, one of the main objections that you get on that from maybe not the people you're talking to um, is that actually you can uh, disconnect, you know, growth and energy and material goods. I, I know among my listeners and along, you know, the people I interview, there is an agreement on that, but I know that this is still a big point that is, uh, discussed or misunderstood and um, so that figure that you mentioned that the fact that we need to realize that when we double our economy we double our basically impact on nature and double the amount of material that we need is, is misunderstood but you will have some people that say we'll find a way to do that differently yeah so let me briefly try and summarize that so historically um before 1970s, GDP and energy were 100% linked. But then we started to get more efficient. We would use the same amount of energy to generate more GDP to the tune of around 1% a year. So that means 99%. But at 99%, that means in year 1972, it took you 100 units of energy to create 100, uh, to create a thing. That same thing in 19, uh, in 2022 would only uh, require 50 units of energy. So people look at that and they're like, look at how energy efficient we, we did. But that's over 50 years. Still, that means in 2023, we're going to need 99 units for some new 
new product. Now, there are some countries, like 30 or 35 countries, that are growing their GDP by using less energy every year, like the United Kingdom and the United States. But that, two things. One, um, that's because we import a lot. We've become service economies, and we import a lot of the heavy lifting and the products that the energy is burned in other countries. So from a climate standpoint, we should only care about the global connection between energy and GDP, and they're very, very tightly coupled. Now, what we can decouple um, is we can grow low carbon energy faster than we grow our economies. And that way we can be decoupling uh, GDP and emissions. And the ultimate decoupling, which I'm hoping for in the future, is decoupling human well-being from energy and material use. And in my own life, I've proven that um, is the case, and, and many people that you and I know um, is the case. But it still stands as a global system, energy and GDP, GDP and materials are tightly linked. And I, I, I don't, unless we change the definition of GDP, I don't think that's going to change because kind of by definition, GDP is the goods and service globally or nationally that, and it's really a, a, a metric of how much stuff we burn. Everything that is in your daily life that you buy this week that contributes to GDP started with a small fire somewhere on the planet. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good way of, uh, again, explaining what it is. Um, Okay, let's go back a little bit to your your podcast. I'm very curious to know. I've listened to most of the conversations that you had with your guests. Um, of course, you have this systemic approach, as you as you explain. You talk about resources, about psychology, about the media, nuclear threat, even, and system thinking as a whole, as a topic itself. What are the ideas or really pieces of information that somehow changed? your 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 point of view your perspectives on on of the whole thing and why if any i think i've gotten clearer on each of my pieces where money comes from um what the risks are from a nuclear war um, the relationship of energy to GDP, which we were just talking about, um, the impact on nature. I think the, the pieces that, you know, the other thing is I, I read this, uh, beautiful, um, couple paragraphs on energy and GDP last week. I'm like, God, that was just so clearly written. And well, it turns out that I wrote it six months, <laughs> six years ago. And it, it's the, the, the enormity of all these topics, it's hard to stay fresh and, and stay on top of all of them. It almost is too much for a single human brain to assimilate. So in talking with my podcast guests, it's kind of a refresher. And these people are all more expert on each of these topics than I am. So it's just kind of an update that I'm kind of riding the wave on it. Um, and it, it's, it's gotten me, um, a lot of clarity on my own points, but it's also made me a little humble in some ways um, that it, it's made me appreciate the diversity in human temperament and understanding and uh, outlook and philosophy and ethic. Because you kind of, I think the default, we can't really change this that we go through life and we think things and we believe things and we want things and we hope things. And then you come across some other humans and you tell them a little story and you just naturally expect for them to think the same as you do. Um, because why wouldn't they? But the only brain I really know is this one. And I'm not even sure I know this one. Um, so when doing a podcast, you, learn where other people are coming from. And most importantly, the feedback I get via email and YouTube, some people love a certain kind of soft 
wisdom, uh, nuance, philosophical discussions, and other people absolutely hate it. They couldn't listen to it. And, and at the same time, some people love the dry, factual oil outlook, and other people are like, I couldn't even stand listening to that. So I've really widened my appreciation and um, understanding of, of the wide variety of human minds and outlooks. And, and that's made it challenging for me to communicate because I'm trying to communicate not to the general public with my podcast. I don't even have an audience other than the people that I expect and hope will tune in because they realize how freaking important this is. Um, but I, I just don't know, Julian, that there is a one message fits all thing for uh, the human predicament. So I, I continue to learn um, and it, it, it really solidifies my own thinking on this. So in addition to the podcast, I'm creating these videos, which are more of a clear, uh, here's Nate's opinion on this. And I'm, I plan on doing a lot more short videos in the future. I, I just, I know this is going to sound hubristic, but I really, um, know that as a human being, I am subject to cognitive biases. We all are. And humans tend to be overly certain, um, of, of events, but I, I see how the pieces of our predicament fit together quite clearly. Um, I don't know if that answered your yeah, question or not. And, and it leads me to another question that's very much linked to, to that, which is how much can we actually grab, understand, um, and explain, <clears throat> you know, of, of that whole complexity, because the whole thing is is it's about how the world functions, right? And uh, it's also trying to guess based on what we see of this mechanism, what's going to to happen, what will be the trajectory. Are we, in a sense, you know, that's a question I'm asking to myself. Like, is it is it pointless? Are we able just to grasp? the reality of it all because we have certainties we we know physics we you know, and this why energy is so is key we know human behaviors but the entire thing is so complex when you take a trajectory it leads to a certain point but uh, i think it was your your friend daniel who was explaining it it doesn't tell you anything theoretically about what's going to be next because sometimes you can have some sort of events that are totally unexpected uh, you see my point, like, is it, and then we can talk about convincing people, but first about making sense of it all. Like the more I dig, the more I see, and I, I, I have this feeling of understanding, but at the same time, I have this feeling that I, I don't understand anything. <laughs> yeah, that that's an excellent question. Um, I think I've spent 20 years assembling the, what I view as the, the, total human predicament, but there's so many things that I don't know. And by definition, I don't know what I don't know. So no one can grasp all of the reality. Um, if you understand human behavior, energy, and ecology, you have a good part of it. And then there's technology and cultural evolution and all kinds of other unknowns. Um, I gave a talk a couple weeks ago um, it was a version of this year's Earth Day talk with the tarot cards, and I tightened it up. It went very well, but it was to a group of like life coaches and uh, social psychologists. And the woman came up to me after, and she gave me a hug and said, that was so beautiful. I I've never understood all these things. She's like, you do know that only 10% of humans have a container physiologically, psychologically to take this in. Right. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, it, it, it's so deep and threatening and contrary to the, their built identities that not that many people can take this on board and then continue with what they were doing that week at their job or their family. And I never really thought about it that way. So, um, you know, if you, if you draw a two by two grid, there are certain people who have catastrophic personalities that they overestimate the likelihood of unlikely extreme events. 
And then there's people on the opposite side who are optimistic and they kind of underestimate because they have an optimism bias. They just assume that things will continue that, that the way they were. And on the other side of the grid is knowing a lot about our systemic predicament and knowing very little about nuclear war and species loss and climate change risk and, and whatever. So if you group people into those four things, those four categories, I suspect, and there's no science on this, I'm just guessing, that a lot of people on in our tribe are the catastrophic type personalities that are very uh, anxious and uh, uh, generally um, extrapolating risks that, that might be smaller than they sense, and they know a lot about our situation. And those people are very vocal in the climate change discussions and everything. So uh, what I've learned is that humans really like, well, let me phrase it differently. Humans really dislike uncertainty and, um, they like certainty. Like they want to hear someone saying, this is the way it is. And, um, that's what this means for your life. Whereas when we talk about a system, the more things we add to the system, uh, what the central banks might do or what Putin might do or the financial system or the endocrine disrupting plastics. It's nuance and adding like second derivative calculus in your brain on all these things. And it adds to uncertainty that is actually physically discomfort to your brain. So on one side, people prefer certainty um, that everything is going to work out, that Elon Musk is going to solve all this, that we're all going to eventually have our great, great grandchildren having great lives circling Mars or on the other side that we're screwed. It's Mad Max and there's nothing we can do. And both of those poles are really attractive to the human brain. And so you mentioned my friend, Daniel, I just did a podcast with him that was so beautiful. Um, and it's true that we, here's the analogy he gave, and I'll just repeat it briefly here. He grew people into three groups, the pre-tragic, which is this place of naivete, everything's going to work out for me and, and the world. And then the tragic where you face reality and everything sucks and it's kind of dystopian. And then the post-tragic, which is I recognize all these things that are wrong with the world. And yet I still want to play a role to the best of my ability anyways, knowing that the odds are stacked, uh, in a difficult way, but I want to, uh, uh, attach my meaning and purpose towards doing the right thing anyway. And he said it way more beautifully than I just did. Um, but I think that's who I'm trying to reach, uh, with my podcast and my thinking is those people who can take on board, uh, most of this and play a role, uh, maybe just being a better neighbor or a better parent, uh, or making an influence in their community, or maybe at an institutional level, preparing their organization or institution or government for what's coming in a, in a better way. But yeah, I struggle with it all the time um, because it's it's really it's also hard with our social media twenty four seven. There's things happening on all these things at all times, and it, it drives you nuts a little bit. So, to me, if I if I just break it down into these components: energy and money and technology, human behavior and the environment, I don't need to look at all those events that are happening because there's a there's a roadmap that I'm kind of following. And then there is another question linked to linked to this, which is how <clears throat> how useful is it to show and to explain? Uh, that's that's what that lady that talked to you said. Like do you realize that only you know ten percent of what you of the people can can take it. But does it change anything to explain climate change with science, to explain energy and resources depletion, to explain these mechanisms, you know? Because we we tend to believe that if people understood clearly what's going on, they would change. Yeah. How, 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 is that true? Yeah. That's a great question, Julian. Um here's my thoughts on that. I think for for most people, knowing the full story of what's happening is probably not helpful. In fact, if I could push a button and have everyone on the planet know what you and I know about this topic, I'm not sure that I would do it. Uh, 
because I think that would accelerate the phase shift towards a different uh, uh, outlook towards the world of scarcity when the pie might get smaller instead of bigger. But I do think um, that 10% or I don't know what the number is, I think we absolutely do need to communicate what's going on because a lot of people are trying to optimize for climate, solving climate as the problem when climate is just a symptom of a larger dysfunction. So we have to have more people understand the centrality of energy, the, uh, the, the um, momentum and built in requirement of growth in the financial system. And so if we have our leaders and kind of the, the cultural um, scout team understanding these things, I think that's of vital importance. But that's another thing I've learned with the podcast. I used to just naively think I get these facts out to the most people possible and good things will happen. And I, I no longer necessarily believe that. So, um, you know, I mean, theoretically, what, 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 what do you think? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> you, you're turning the, you're becoming the interviewer again. Well, uh, I think that, um, I mean, with con regarding what you said about the different categories of people, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very, very true. And I stopped what my approach to it is that I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. Uh, I'm just the way I'm positioning the podcast is, um, Hey, uh, this is a very complex issue. There are a lot of questions before, you know, as we said before, let's, let's find what are the questions before going into the answers. Um, stop. So my approach, my positioning is not to, 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 to tell the truth is to say, this is complicated. Can we stop thinking that we are right and start listening to each other and maybe from there you could have some t some kind of collective intelligence that happens but to be honest i know i have zero i'm not on a mission i'm not trying to change the world i'm not trying to have a huge impact i'm doing this because i find it interesting in intellectually and because this is my own way of uh, dealing with this you know like my anxiety etc But I, what I always say is that I avoid saying you must or we must. I, I'm, it's like a stoicism approach to things. Like I'm, I want to understand and from then build my own ethic and, and hoping that some people listening to yeah. it will, will find it helpful. I totally agree with that. Do I say I must and we no, must? No. Do I do that? That's why I like your podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's the other thing you ask what's changed and that's hard to answer on the spot. But another thing that's changed is six months ago, I would say, um, okay, so what are the solutions? Here are the solutions. I no longer like the word solutions because what we face is a predicament. There is no solution. There are responses. There are millions of potentially good responses depending on your situation and your scale, but there is no solution to what we face. Um, And yeah, I'm, I mean, that's probably why we're friends because I, I really am aligned with that philosophy. I'm just trying to describe what's happening and I can point people in a direction of, of what I think is, is going to happen, but I don't know. Um, I'm pretty sure we won't be able to continue to grow globally for much longer. And if we do, um, we're going to take in more of the natural world than we already have. So there is no like magical answer how to solve all that. Um, and, and I agree with you that at, at a certain level, I enjoy understanding the world that I live in. So how these pieces fit together, even though they're kind of a shitty prognosis, um, it, reduces my anxiety a little bit to understand what's going on but i don't know if that's the same for for other people or not i, well, can only I, speak I know for that myself. a lot of people are cannot do that because they need uh to be able to cope with it and maybe there are people that are more naturally action driven you know that don't like to reflect spend time just reflecting on things and i get i, I get i get this often you know like okay it's cool to think about all this but what do you do Uh, what do you change? You know, what do you, what do you tell people to be doing? You know, th there is an emergency here, but the thing is, um, this 
bird's eye view, as you say, uh, you know, gives me some kind of clarity or, or, or um, let me put it another way. I only see hypothesis. I only see if we do this, if we uh, we fight inequality, you know, if we have different uh, people that are in charge, if, uh, I don't know, we, we, we invest in a different way, if we change culture, etc., if we, we change the way social media work. And all these topics are very, very interesting, you know, and these are our potential solutions. The thing is, I don't see the beginning of a plan, basically, to implement this. Uh, it's like, yeah, if we change social media and, and the way the, the economy works, and if we change uh, GDP, but okay, but, you know, where do you start? And this is why I like your, your vision of that kind of uh, the super organism. And uh, and I have, a, I have a question on free will related to that. But maybe you want to react to this. With your with your French accent, it almost sounded like a super <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> Never heard it pronounced super that organism. way. But um, go ahead with <laughs> go ahead. Ask your your question. I was going to tell you about something that recently happened to me, but go ahead. I'll, um, I'll remember. No, it's basically you know everywhere I look now, I see these systems that are completely stuck. Uh, you, you mentioned the fact that degrowth is a great idea, but hey, we've got depth. And if the minute you just you start saying we yeah. degrowth, so I see people that don't want to change anything or can't change, and I also see people fighting for change, but often with very little results. So. And that, that questions, what, do we have free will here? Do we have, are we in charge? Okay, let me try to unpack that. Um, as individuals, I don't believe we have free will. I do believe we have free won't, which is if you add enough cognitive work and discipline, you can train yourself to do th things that in the moment your earlier self can trump the emotional impulse of the moment. For instance, I taught myself to have a uh, physical aversion to eating pork because I love dogs. And I visualized a, a truckload full of dogs being turned into pork. And so I trained myself to have free won't that I don't eat pork. But I think generally in the moment, human individuals don't have free will. Also, I don't think society in normal circumstances has free will at the cultural level. For instance, right now we are beholden to the uh, market. We have outsourced our decisions to the market and humans didn't evolve to be greedy or hierarchical, but we were born into this system that this metabolic growth machine is pulling us forward. But where we might have cultural free will is during the phase shifts, as Milton Friedman said, um, you know, don't ever let a good crisis go to waste. When there are crises, it's the education and the ethic and the understanding and the break glass plans that are in place at that moment. That's when cultural, uh, you could say that cultures have free will. But I think right now that we're doing little piecemeal things like they just passed this inflation reduction act in the United States that's good for climate. It's a scam. It's not, it's just totally at the margin. It's not good for climate that they got extra funding for some renewable energy and, and other things. It's just going to grow the metabolism of the system. The things that we need to do to fix our system and to save the environment are politically and socially untenable today. So I recognize that long ago that the higher status person you're in the room with the least, the less able they are to articulate, we're in financial and ecological overshoot, we're going to have to have a smaller economy and tighten our belt. Uh, the whole pie is eventually going to be smaller. And we need to prepare for that. They cannot say those things. What, why is that? But what can be done? Well, because they first of all, um, if they say those things, they will be unpopular and not elected. And second of all, if they say those things, they're going to require answers for them. And there are no answers for them. There are better answers than 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 worse ones. 
it's a it's a triage situation because we're not going to be able to keep everyone happy so there's going to have to be very tough political decisions made look at what's happening in in france and germany right now with the drought and the heat and russia um already you're preparing for some very difficult decisions this winter so this in in i i hope it doesn't resolve in or result in in a bigger war with with nuclear bombs and things like that and that it maybe it results in just a partitioning of ukraine and then things go back to the way they were but there is a, a tiny bright side of what's happening with russia and ukraine is it's removing the energy blinders of society people in europe and indirectly in, in america are realizing oh my god our society is completely dependent on on fossil energy so I think, and this is what I did last week, I was in Finland um, presenting to government officials um, on different future energy scenarios and economic scenarios where they can grow the amount of renewable energy, low carbon energy. Um, you know, they're, they're only 42% dependent on fossil fuels right now. They get 58% of their energy from some form of renewable energy, they could even grow that. But the scenario was looking at a smaller economy. How could we do this with a lower total amount of throughput? And that is kind of a verboten topic. But if you treat it as a scenario, this might happen. I think those Scandinavian countries that have low population density and a very high social contract might be able to plan some things um, that other countries like my country wouldn't be able to to do. So I, I think, is this information helpful? Is understanding the metabolic superorganism helpful? I would say absolutely to some people. I got contacted last week by a government agency in the United States that watched my video and they're using it as a litmus test with people within their network to see if they understand the problem, which I thought was just high praise um, that it was used in that regard. So I, I do think educating leaders um, who will be in positions of power in the coming decade about how these pieces fit together and the centrality of, of energy and ecology to our system is important and worthwhile. And the moment that I decide that's not the case, I will not do a third podcast with you. <laughs> uh, uh, that that reminds me, uh, not the joke, but what you said before, that reminds me of the conversation you had with uh, uh, Nora Bateson, wh whom I'm trying to get on the podcast, by the way, but uh, when you discussed system thinking, and uh, I thought that was very interesting to her take on how a system changes i believe if i if i got it right that she said we we try basically to fix systems by looking at the different parts and what we need to know especially when the system is complex what we need to do is to try to understand how a system learns and uh, that's the only way to to you know to be helpful about uh our ability to change it what did you understand from that because that 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 was very insightful to me because it says that this it's not about the solutions or trying to understand the system as a whole it's really much more about the process or, or how you put people together to to come to come up with something Well, I think, did she say that on my podcast? Yes, I think so, yeah. Uh, that's the only, probably yeah. that's the only, you know, time. I, I, I need to go, to I need to go back and uh, read the transcripts of my, I don't remember that. Um, to be honest, I've never listened to a single one of my podcasts. I probably should. Uh, I would probably learn uh, some things, but I do the podcast and then I move on to the next one. Uh, Nora is a very wise and intelligent person. And I think what she meant by that is to watch how the people learn in a system uh my own take is i don't know that our system is learning because i think our system is akin to a blind hungry giant amoeba that's just sloughing forward in time 
slurping up low entropy goodies with no uh, regard to the well-being of its constituent parts, which would be us, uh, nor the environment. So I think if we understand how that system learns, it doesn't, we can look at its trajectory and plan ahead for what's likely to happen. I think what Nora is trying to do is fuse system science with real human interaction, which she calls warm data, and see how the people respond to each other and the knowledge and create some emergent learning. And I, I fully think that is one of the things that gives me hope in the world is more people speaking the language that you and I are speaking on this call and rolling things around and expanding their group of five to eight people that talk about it and maybe doing something in their small village in Spain or France or and all of a sudden there's lots of these things happening in the world that happened because of our, our hearts and our minds were aligned uh, in, in anticipation of a, a change in our culture. And I, I don't know what that looks like, but you know, just the, the feeling I get, you and I have talked half a dozen times, you know, I consider you a friend and a fellow traveler who pretty much understands, uh, you know, this, the system that we're a part of. And you're kind of, like you said, you're a stoic and you're observing and, and kind of trying to understand and get your mind around it. But with a pro-social philosophy, you would like the future to be better. You would like us to make better decisions and you're just playing a role. I just think we need millions of more people like that. So if we, I mean, there are a lot of people thinking of what should be done to, uh, you know, to change that trajectory. There's one way of seeing it as, okay, there is nothing that can be done because the system can't change. And I tend to agree with that. But theoretically, you know, beyond the symptoms, what is it that you think would be the most efficient levers to to pull somehow? Is it, or, or you know, what is what is really the most important thing preventing us from doing anything serious is it about money is it about finance is it about all of this connected all together or try to 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 does it make sense actually to, to try to to find out because i'm um, just just to want to just want to help all these people trying to that are already doing things i don't want them to feel like okay this is all useless and uh to get your point of view on on what are the different levers I think the single most important barrier um, to change isn't finance. It's that we use social sorting mechanisms to solve physical world problems. We look at people's status and that dictates how much of the truth we can say. And I've sat down with a lot of uh, former politicians, current politicians having a beer in a private restaurant that agree with a lot of what I'm saying, but they just couldn't say it publicly. So if you look at what are the core things that we could switch, it would be um, let's have maybe at a local regional scale, you could have these conversations in a productive way. Another core driver of our problems is the prices are wrong. We're underpaying for the main input to our societies that has supported vast amounts of consumption and um, uh, standards of living, but we're paying the wrong prices for two reasons. One is because we're drawing down this fossil bank account that supports our economies very, very rapidly. And number two is we're not paying at all for the cost of pollution. Um, for the most part, we're, we're not paying for the true cost of the energy that underpins our living standards. But to try and put a carbon tax or a tax on all non-renewable inputs, including things like copper or fossil water aquifers or uranium, if we put a tax on that, that implies a smaller economy and less consumption, and no one's going to vote for that right now. Uh, but that is one of the things that over the, the next 50 years, we could shift the tax burden away from humans towards non-renewable inputs, which 
in theory, would result in better innovation because people, scientists and developers and uh, entrepreneurs would have the better signals of scarcity and these things that are going away very quickly to make better inventions. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing would be we would conserve. We wouldn't frivolously waste things on uh, just junkets to Las Vegas or little gigas that we buy in our house because we would appreciate we we would appreciate the energy services that we get. So I do think that's one of the the levers. Uh, as far as people hearing this story and saying, "Oh my God, it's so overwhelming! What do I do?" Um, there is that risk. I think learning the full systemic overview, the initial reaction is um, that it it removes agency from a person. It's like, oh my God, this whole thing is, we're in this runaway train and we're just shoveling fuel into it and there's nothing we can do. Well, one of the first things you can do is meet other like-minded humans on the dining car and talk about this and uh, even if you don't find resolution and answers, just the mere talking about it with another human reduces your uh, cortisol and boosts your helper T cells. Just having this conversation with you, we're not coming up with any answers, but I feel a human connection with you. Um, if I could do one thing, though, um, professionally with people working in the climate energy system space is all of these people are assuming that we are going to continue to grow into the future and we just need to do that in a low carbon way or in a more equitable way. I, I would ask or, or if, if I could, I would want all the people working on future scenarios to maybe consider just a 10% chance that we're going to have a smaller economy in the future and that we're going to have to respond to that and just doesn't have to be certain, just maybe a five or 10% chance of that scenario manifesting and how would that change their work? Uh, and that could be helpful because it could spur creativity um, that is lacking right now because people feel that we're kind of locked into to this scenario, like you said. Among all the things that you're looking at, what are the, let's call them positive weak signals, like the things that you see already emerging that could have maybe an impact on the trajectory, or that could be uh, positive in a way once things simplify? It's a great question. Um, I think the, the clearest, most positive, hopeful thing that I've noticed is I just got back from two weeks in Europe. And by the way, the social contract in Europe is so different than the United States. I was mostly in Scandinavian countries. I was in uh, Netherlands, uh, Denmark, uh, Germany, and Finland. And I just got the feeling that there's more of a focus on the we than the I. And when I flew back from Amsterdam to uh, Minneapolis, I got the same feeling as when I fly from Minneapolis to Las Vegas. It was just this cultural, uh, different feeling. I loved Finland and Denmark. Uh, like I r rented a bike and was just driving around. And uh, anyways, it's, it's just a different vibe. But the, the, the hopeful feeling I get is I'm meeting hundreds and hundreds of people at conferences and workshops that are having the same conversation that you and I are having and they're dedicated and they have love and care and you know, they're going to sacrifice and do things in the future when they have to. And I just want to, you know, play my small part in growing that amount to tens of millions of humans. And I don't think we face a disaster. I just think we face a shrinkage in what we've come to expect. And honestly, I, I don't think the shrinkage is the biggest risk. I don't think having 10% less energy is the biggest risk. I think it's the complexity that we've built with a six continent supply chain and all these little components for our pharmaceuticals and our tractors are coming from different countries. 
And so we need to start thinking about maybe relocalizing and re-regionalizing our supply chains. Um, but the hopeful thing is, uh, is humans, you know, I, I really, and there's going to be some bad actors as they always are when, when times get tough, but the people that I've met, I just am buoyed by, and, um, it makes me motivated to, to continue to do this work. I've, I've met so many wonderful people. I want to talk about hope because you, 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 you said the word, uh, I find personally some people too hopeful and because they think that, for yep. example, technology will solve our problems or because we will somehow change the world and, and, and go through the simplification in a very peaceful way and, you know, and build a new kind of civilization, etc. But I also find some people not hopeful enough, you know, too kind of too certain that everything will collapse and the humanity that humanity is over soon you know for some people it's like tomorrow and personally i have little hope as i mentioned before in that the systemic change needed will happen because there are too many hurdles but at the same time and in complex systems as we as we, as we said you know some some sometimes happen what we call an emergence something that's totally unexpected and uh and also you know hope is needed to stay positive in a, in a sense i guess but that's a question i have how much do you think that hope is actually necessary or even useful in our situation um i heard dennis meadows i think also in your podcast saying that when you ask the question in the end like uh you know are you hopeful what make, what keeps you hopeful and he said i think that it's it's not a an important question <laughs> it's not the problem it's not about hope but I, i want to have your take on this uh do we need to grow through that phase of losing hope first to build something else or um do we need to stay hopeful to continue you know doing what we do what's your personal take on that it's a tough one <laughs> <laughs> I've long ago grieved for the future that society is marketing to us. So I've been sad um, and sometimes lost hope over the last 15 to 20 years. And so over time, the probability distribution in my brain of what the future will be has shifted so that now my expectations for the next 20 or 30 years are so different than societies that I actually am hopeful that things could be better than the middle of my own distribution. So first of all, is hope necessary? Um, it depends on p the person's physical and mental situation on their life situation. Um, if you're a poor person, person living without air conditioning in the Middle East right now. I mean, the word hope in the context of this conversation is very different than someone making a career change in Minneapolis or, or Paris. Um, I, I think it also depends on what people think about the future. And I, I do think there's kind of a grieving process that has to happen to allow you to get to a Um, a reality informed hope. And I agree with you. A lot of people, I mean, we have this cultural, it's almost like this Madison Avenue necessity where they show an advertisement. You suck, but if you buy this product, you will be cool. And they show all these environmental movies, like all the destruction and the elephant poaching and the oceans. But at the end, if we go to renewables and solar, we can fix it. And it's almost like you have to paste this happy thing at the end. And I actually think over time, uh, this is being counterproductive because people feel that that's disingenuous and that the story and the ask of us is much deeper than that. So I think we need a group of humans, millions, but not billions that recognize what's going on, have 
grieved a little bit for the cultural fairy tale of, of continued economic growth and prosperity and roll their sleeves up, find the others and do the hard work that's necessary, living with the uncertainty and living with this stuff. And I mean, that's how I feel, Julian, but uh, that may be super weird and maybe other people aren't like that at all. Um, I hope there are. Um, because that's, that's where I'm at. But I, I do think, am I hopeful? Yes, I'm hopeful because I have lower expectations and I'm kind of a hopeful guy. Um, so, but for, for some people, you're absolutely right. They're either too hopeful because maybe because they're not, because they're ignorant or don't understand these things, but because they require that hope in order to remain functional in their own lives. And on the, on the other side, there are people that really are so miserable with their expectations of the future that they kind of want to bring others into their misery with them because then that feels bearable because I've got six people that I can say that we're going extinct in the next 12 years and we all think that so we're kind of keeping each other company. Um, but I think that there again, certainty is is the, uh, um, the killer there. Um, I, I think we have to keep uncertainty um, uh, alive and fresh in our brains. And that's hard. That's, that's a hard thing to do. Certainty. I, I think that grieving process that you mentioned is, uh, essential. I think most people that are digesting this information are going through it, even though it's always difficult to grieve something that has not happened. Ah, uh, yeah. Except, except that's, that's you know, that's the other thing also, that right? I kind of have a pet peeve about people. Exactly. People are saying, well, uh, when would collapse happen? And what they mean by that is when yeah, would collapse yeah. happen for you? Because collapse is already happening in mm -hmm. Sri Lanka so and, and, and for uh, the living Bangladesh and to the insects and to the dolphins. Uh, exactly. Um, my, yeah. my personal way of dealing with this, I mentioned, you know, stoicism before, because I think there is an interesting answer on in philosophy overall, and uh, which is that you need to focus on um, what you what's in your hands. Basically, it's like just focus on you what you can control, and, and the rest in the end doesn't really matter because it uh, it creates negative emotions. It makes you sad. It makes you angry. It makes you it scares you, but it, you have no control over it like the what's going to happen in in what how is going to be uh how how the climate is going to be in uh, 30 years you have zero control about it this is why i i mentioned the fact that i quit the idea of uh you know changing the world and i'm, I'm doing this for other reasons but well we do we need um so here's another thing that i talked to this woman about who gave me the hug after this call she explained to me why only 10% of humans can take this on board in a mature way to have a container. And during the conversation, I, I had this like lightning strike of insight that if that's true, why am I spending so much time refining the mess, uh, the message of the economic, uh, money, technology, energy, hungry, super organism, to refine it, to be better and better so that people understand it. I should be spending my time on growing the number of humans from that 10% to something larger that have the mental and physical and spiritual well-being to, to take this on and play a role. And so I think, you know, stoicism is one way and you talk about conditional versus unconditional goals, which is something I tell my students is you're right. A lot of things that are coming in our future, you have no control over, but there's a lot of things you can control. Um, you know, your morning routines and your, your mental and physical health and, um, you know, where you get your food and all these sorts of things. So I do think this movement of being more holistic, healthy, meditative, grounded, uh, socially connected humans is almost a precursor towards the other uh, responses that socially we're going to have. One big thing I've noticed, and I'm struggling with this, but I'm, I'm making progress, 
is we live in a world that we have 24 seven access to nature and to other humans, the skies, the stars, the trees, the animals, other humans. We also have 24 seven access to dopamine and social media and information. And that is stronger. It shouts louder to our brains than the real things that our ancestral past uh, uh, prepared us for. And so we have to build walls and procedures and rules in our own life so that our we can trump the impulse of wanting to check social media 15 times a day. Um, because we need more people tethered to the real world, the, the natural and the human world than the technology one in order to have the fully grounded humans to engage with what's coming. My, my own I, philosophy. I tell you also, like, well, because I'm spending a lot of time with the uh, old philosophers because I'm, I'm finishing a book uh, to summarize all that. And uh, I find, I find great answers there. Stoicism is helpful, but you also, you also have sp- Spinoza, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right in English, but, uh, and his take on the non-existent, non-existence of free will, and yet the possibility of living an ethical and joyful life, that's also something. Because it's also about, it's, it's what Stoics say about the fact that you basically, uh, you, you should focus on yourself and focus on the decisions that you're making. It doesn't mean that you can't do anything and you can't change anything, but it's just about trying to be ethical, using reason to take care of yourself, to take care of your community, to take care of what, what's within your grasp, within your, your control. And I find it super helpful because that's, that's, way, that's a relief. You don't need to take the whole uh, way of the world on your shoulders. You just need to uh behave in a certain way that makes you happy and what they say basically is that this way and this is all the wisdoms you know around the world say this is this way of behaving behaving ethically is very much compatible with uh what we should be hoping for which is to take care of other people which is to be uh to consume less to be content with few things etc etc i don't know what's your take on that I, I totally agree. Um, I read Spinoza 20 years ago, so I don't, uh, or 30 years ago. Um, but I totally agree. The more humans we have that have that ethic and have started to already, you know, simplified first and beat the rush, and they're already living differently, thinking differently, interacting differently with their colleagues and their community and their family, the better odds we're going to have of a somewhat uh, viable transition. Um, when, when these events happen. So if we could multiply by a thousand times the number of humans that are just behaving differently in that way, we, we can create a scout team that acts as a rock in the river when the water starts rushing. It, it'll hold things together and maybe even redirect the water if we get enough people. I mean, that you said it better than, than I, but that's what we really need. We as in and I guess also modern society. Get local. That's that's maybe one of the things that you've looked at, but there are when you say there are many issues, many global issues that we can't really tackle, you know, as an individual. There are when you change the scale and you think about your yourself, your family, and then your your community, then you become able to have some kind of impact. I think to me that's the next thing to explore. You know, like uh, if I want to act on something. I, I totally agree. I mean, the problem really is ecological overshoot. And so the global response is unlikely to, to happen. Um, we're going to play whack-a-mole and continue to react. Me personally, um, despite me believing that local response is the most important thing, I have to keep trying yep. on this global narrative that we might be able to shift Um, but I think for your listeners, uh, and for most people, I think the local response, uh, building community where you are, um, and changing your behaviors and your thought process. I mean, if you really understand how we've used money to kick the can of a recession depression, 
Um, and we've done this repeatedly with central bank largesse and changing the rules and the COVID stimulus package and artificial interest rates and the ECB guaranteeing Italian and periphery debt. If you really understand how temporary those things are, and you understand that humans will not en masse change to voluntarily reduce our consumption, you can quite viscerally imagine a time in the next decade where there's this financial recalibration. And if you feel that emotionally real enough, even though it's a future scenario, you can have that emotion spur you to action in your own life, in your family, in your community. What you say is um, recession and, uh, you know, the bank system that stops functioning normally just just to understand because these I, i know these topics are not simple for for most people in the 1930s in the united states from the peak of our size of our economy to the bottom before we started to grow again we fell 29.6 percent in the size of our economy that was a great depression And I think something around those terms is probably coming in the next decade. It wouldn't have had to be that big, but we've built such a financial bubble with all these monetary claims uh, approaching $400 trillion globally um, that I, I think something like that would, would be coming again. And that's kind of a shocking thing to say, but then we would only be back to 1990s levels of per capita um, consumption, which wouldn't have to be a disaster. I don't know the exact numbers, but something of that magnitude. Um, so just imagine everyone listening to this was making 30% less uh, in their salaries, so something like that. And of course, distribution would also be an issue because some people that don't have jobs or very low jobs to make 30% less is going to be a problem. Last question uh, and prepared. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry to, to kind of close on that on that downer note, but that that is what no, I. No, I mean, That's what my analysis it's, uh, suggests. It's, and we could spend we, we could do an entire episode on uh, on you know finance and the economy, you know, based on your knowledge. So maybe that would be for the thing. The thing is, Julian, uh, is what I just said. To be honest, for, for your listeners, I don't think is going to be that big of a surprise. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, last question. What's, uh, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> is, is, are you like me? You ask the same questions at the end to everyone. Um, no, I just, I just asked it to Noam Chomsky and it was very quick answering it. So I hope. What did you, he say? He <laughs> said the meaning of life is just, uh, what you make of it. You decide. Yeah. I, I just never his, really his thought answer. about it. <laughs> I've never really thought about it, but I like his answer. Um, I love my life right now. Uh, I'm not making much money. I don't have much savings. I feel like I'm in the middle of uh, the most incredibly important conversation and discussions about our future of our species culture. And I'm probably going to play a tiny, tiny, tiny infinitesimal role of, of shifting things, but it feels really important to me. And it feels like everything I've done in my past, my, my studies, my connections, my networks, my social relationships, my rolling this stuff around in my head when I go on a bike ride is all coalescing so that my life has meaning right now. And so Uh, I don't know what the meaning of life is. I know that my life has meaning right now. And so I would wish that any of your listeners find whatever path that is uh, for themselves and just take a step towards it. It took me 20 years to get to this point because I cared about animals and I wanted to learn about the climate. And 20 years later, I have a podcast and I'm on some other guy's podcast named Sismique in France. So um, <laughs> I'll just stop there. <laughs> I love your accent too, your French accent. Well, thanks, thanks a lot for this uh, one hour and a half conversation. I, I, I mean, I think we could uh, we could talk for another hour, but uh, I'm uh, I will need to translate all that, so <laughs> I want to stop here. <laughs> You're very well, welcome, Julian. Thanks a lot, and mate. thanks again for your help and advice uh, in the past year or so. Sure, I, I'm really glad to see what you what you did with that. 
Well, thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Okay. Ciao.